wanted the audience to almost experience something which was otherworldly and um, I wanted them to feel a sense of being in a different time, in a different space, a sense of sand dunes moving across the space and a sense of being on vast land and being in a place that makes you feel almost alone on a journey. At the same time, being able to enter a world which doesn't necessarily belong to today but becomes then a reflection for them now. Samsara is really a journey for your soul. Akash and I first saw Hu Shen Wan on stage in autumn 2016 uh, when we went to Sadler's Wells to see Yang Li Ping's Under Siege. It was a recommendation of our friend Fru Chowdhury, who had in mind another dancer for us to work with. Hu Shen Wan was playing a concubine and uh, he started to move like ever so elegantly, softly, like Mercury. The minute he walked on stage, he just captured us. The sense of his stilt had movements in it. The sense of his silence had a sense of screaming in it. But what was most incredible is when he started to actually move, he was like mercury, like water. I mean, he slithered across the stage with such effortless flow. And I still remember each and every member of the audience around me being um, gobsmacked and just sitting there in silence, completely captivated by this dancer who moved like a god. Um, and when I saw him dance, my heart instantly said to me, you know, why can't I dance with him? He's the one. So there was an instant connection. And I think what was more important was all the other dancers were like explosions going outwards, but he was like this supernova, which exploded but pulled us all in. Uh, we'd got a, a small grant from Arts Council England to um, do some development work in China with the dancer and some weeks before we were about to depart well, we got a call from Farouk saying I'm really sorry but the other guy has got a job um, a, a, like a commercial job and he can't commit to the project anymore and for a moment I was like oh no what do we do now because we've got some support to kind of make this project happen Our producer and Farouk Anand and Farouk suggested why don't you work with the boy who played the geisha, which was who, which was the person I really actually wanted to work with. I think you can call it the law of attraction because I think there was an instant sense of attraction to his spirit and his soul. I knocked on Farouk's door again and said, look, why don't you reach out to this other person um, who we liked and Farouk thankfully made the phone call. and. Um, and yes, so Hu Shen Wan agreed to see Akash and they met for the first time in March 2017 in Shanghai. They did a kind of a small workshop series when Hu was rehearsing it for his own kind of company project at the time. Uh, they liked each other so much that they decided uh, that it would be worth meeting again. So we invited Hu to Leicester for the first time in May 2017. On that occasion, I kind of uh, preempted the kind of thinking for Akash and said, I think really after this, you, you need to make a decision whether you want to work with him or not, because otherwise um, there's a lot of dating going on without any commitment. And it's a long, long way to China and for China to here. Uh, for, for you to continue to do that. Luckily for me, they said, no, we're going to make something. And uh, that's how the journey began. Thank mm -hmm. you.
One two. One two three. One two three. One two. One two. And no 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 no. The biggest challenge that they both had was that who does not speak any English and Akash doesn't speak any Mandarin. And so it's very difficult for them to uh, communicate through words, but found that they could communicate quite effectively through movement. Um, and so there was something that was inviting each other into a space, regardless of the spoken word barrier. So I could see that they could bring out the best in each other. Uh, and that gave me the impetus to say, no, I think, I think that they can make something really beautiful together. I think what was really interesting about me and who was I spoke no Mandarin and he spoke no English. So the question was how do we communicate? We found a sense of communicating through movement and through feel and through the, the body's own intelligence to understand the other. And it became for us a language without words. Not often the translator would start translating and I would interject and intervene and say, oh, I think he actually needs this. And often who would do the same? So there was a real deep uh, understanding. One could even say an ESP, an extrasensory perception of what was happening around us. And that became for me the base of samsara, where the languages, cultures and boundaries really blurred. It became a sense of the journey of the soul and made my connection to who, without language, more profound. Wo 眼睛和心灵的交流 Through the sense of soul, through the sense of musicality, space. So these all became factors in our discovery of one another and the language of the universe that we wanted to speak. A very, almost like a very primitive language, you could say. You know, one could say, I mean, how do people communicate before the sense of language? And also through this channel, I feel like we tuned in to each other's pasts and one could say even past lives. We were like one soul which was split in half and sent in two different sides of the world through our various samsaras and journeys to again meet up to complete one journey together. I feel samsara really is, a, is an amazing example of cultural interdependency. The fact that a monk makes a journey which is 14 years uh, to India to retrieve original Buddhist scriptures and bring it back to China against the imperial rule at the time and the sentence for uh, disobeying the emperor's death. But the monk did it for a selfless reason. He wanted to go and receive in a world today where we're kept being reminded that it's important to keep building walls between communities and kind of keep people out and the talk about migration and people are so toxic you know we're reminded that you know, 2,000 years ago people voluntarily left their land to seek knowledge in other places that we were interdependent on each other's advancement of our own societies um, and samsara really brings that message home. I feel that at the end of the day, um, there is a sense of every culture, every human has the same 
soul, or spirit in them as I have in myself. So what breathes through me is the same air that breathes through the opposite person. I feel now that people also have stopped seeing differences between themselves. And I think that was one of the aims of Samsara, that there was a sense of, like I said, this cultural interdependency, this sense of yearning um, uh, for knowledge. And I feel like knowledge goes beyond ego. And I think that's important. We formed some really great partnerships to realise Samsara. Uh, one of those was the Asia Topa Festival organised by Melbourne Arts Centre in Australia. I met Stephen Armstrong at an APAM conference which takes place in Australia around 2018. I was able to pitch uh, the idea to him. And he said that I should follow him up uh, with an email, so I sent some details across and followed, uh, that was followed on by a phone call. Akash and I were mulling over whether it would be better to kind of do a premiere of Samsara in China where Hu lives or in England where Akash lives. And Stephen was explaining to me that Asia Topa was about kind of presenting the ideas of Asia in a contemporary context. It struck me that Samsara and both Akash and Hu, who were practicing kind of classical and folk forms of dance from both India and China. So I just thought that's the kind of a marriage made in heaven. They offered us a residency space at Lucy Guerin's studio and then at Bunjil Place um, uh, before the premiere. And those, those things really helped for the project to kind of, I guess, find its uh, voice and its potential. Um, during this time, it was interesting because we were, neither of us were in our home zone. We were in a very different environment. So we were both almost cut up from the rest of the world. So our sole focus became the studio uh, and what we created in there and I think that allowed us to really um, bubble in this environment and create an atmosphere which then had a longer shelf life compared to other places that you know we did other places whenever we did residencies it gave us a chance to be able to so immerse ourselves completely in, in this world because the studios gave us unlimited access and we were able to really work through the night. I think it was a great experience and I'm really grateful to them to have given us the space and the time. Mind the gap. We knew from the very beginning that the gestation period for trying to make something was going to be over a longer period of time as we could get each uh, well, gather our resources and get each other to each other's countries and kind of jam in, in a space there to, to make something uh, that was kind of coherent. And I think crossing that uh, bridge was really helped when we had invited members of the Bagri Foundation to come and see Akash uh, perform at the South Bank Centre when he was doing a, a solo performance. And that started a dialogue uh, with them about Akash's kind of future work and um, we invited Al Bagri and the team to see Akash with who at Sadler's Wells Theatre in London where they were just in a rehearsal space together and luckily for us Akash and who rather were able to convey uh, the meaning of what they were trying to, to make to the Bagri Foundation and they they kind of gave us the resources to be able to bridge the kind of geographic divide and make sure that they could keep meeting up and exchange and make something that blended together beautifully. You know, there was a lot of talk, I think, at the early days of, of whether or not there should be live music. And I remember being one of those people that said, of course there must be live music. We knew for a long time that uh, Nicky Wells would be the composer. Akash and Nikki have collaborated on a number of occasions and they've got quite a, a great spark together. Uh, one person I uh, reached out to was a percussionist called Bei Bei Wang and it was quite interesting how I found her. Um, I was looking at a Facebook profile of a friend of mine who plays uh, flute and, um, and then on the kind of mutual friends list 
um, a number of people popped up and then on the non-mutual friends list um, I saw a couple of drumsticks so I looked at this profile of this Bebe and then I googled uh, Bebe and then found videos and was kind of awestruck by uh, the talent so uh, reached out to Bebe by email and Bebe responded and got her into a space uh, at the People Centre in 2019 to kind of try out some stuff uh, and was really impressed and, and wanted to kind of continue working with her. But months passed and Nakash didn't know what the other sounds would look like and he continued those conversations with Nikki and around October of uh, 2019 they kind of said, oh, can you find me a Mongolian throat singer? And at this point in time I, I didn't really know how I could find one, particularly because the show was opening um, in a few months time. And uh, so I went into Overdrive and uh, found uh, some videos of uh, a musician based in the UK called Michael Ormiston and reached out to Michael instantly because I was kind of uh, really fascinated by what he was doing. With great trust in the process and the idea, they invited people in and said, um, this is not a world about Akash and Hu. This is not a world about a single monk. This is a world that we create together. For me, there was definite key pillars in this piece. There was no hierarchy. So there was no dance overpowering the music or music overpowering the, the set. There was a sense of it being almost like ingredients going into a recipe to get the ingredients just right so that the aroma, that we can all enjoy the aroma. And it was this essence and this sense of um, liberation that we wanted to create so that we as the counterparts of this production are all eliminated and it becomes about this story, this atmosphere and the resonating effect it has with the people who are watching it. The world of samsara itself has been interdependent on a multicultural input in order to bring the story to life and both artists although they come from a particular part of the world, um, were so welcoming of so many people to share that journey with them. We also then received uh, a note from our US agent if uh, Akash and who would like to do a residency at the Jacobs Pillow Festival in uh, the USA and of course we jumped at the chance and unfortunately it was around the time it was supposed to be in February 2020 the travel ban for people who had physically been in China um, uh, kicked in uh, because of COVID-19 restrictions and so that residency was cancelled uh, literally a day ahead of us kind of uh, getting out there uh, but Jacob's Pillow were really supportive uh, through the whole process and um, uh, it meant that at that stage we had to get who to come to the UK and at the same time Australia had put in a kind of a travel ban for people who'd literally been in China and so we started to rehearse another dancer called Chang'an and um, luckily for us after about 15 days the travel ban um, for, uh, you know, for, for, for Australia had been lifted for anyone who had been in China, we managed to get who another flight booking um, and get him out there to Australia to rehearse the show. So we managed to open it within minutes. By the end, when we were in Melbourne, working on the premiere, I felt like all these different journeys that were happening all these different parts that are played in samsara, like the set, the sound, the music, were all coming together. It was like, and even if they weren't on the same page, we were on the same parallels, on the same lines, doing the same journey towards the same destination. And that's when I felt a sense of the synergy coming together, and this piece really now taking on a life of its own. <laughs> Jingjang 
但是当每天的工作一步步进行的时候，会发现啊，终于会越来越适应。And until the last moment, when I was going on stage, I was unsure, you know, about this work. Is it something that people are going to understand and absorb, or is it something that lives only in my imagination? But、um, I just had to say to myself, "We've done everything we can. Now is the time to surrender." Even though it was hard, knowing that this child has been nurtured for the past three years, you know, you cried with this child, laughed with this child. You've given it absolutely everything that you possibly can to nourish it and make it grow, but there comes a point where you say, "This is it. Surrender, give in, and pass it over to the other side, to the people who are watching, you know, the people in front of me and also above." The project、uh, on its premiere run in Australia's Asia Toper Festival was. A resounding success. Really, really couldn't be more pleased with it.、Um, I think the critics were、uh, were raving about the show, which is obviously very nice. But Samsara is made for what I call everyday people. It's not、uh, mired in kind of complicated,、uh, you know, layers of choreography that are trying to be too clever in itself. It's it's a it's a piece about spiritualism. Uh, that is there to connect to the hearts of the audience members. Just in the last time I saw the show, I was very happy. After this film, I finally experienced a three-year production of the show. I finally showed it, and I won a success. I hope that this film can soon be released on the stage. 因为我想，我的阿卡什，我们都一定会带入新的生活和新的想法，重新回到这部作品里面。Soon as the last light was dimming and the last grain of sand fell on my head, I felt this wall of applause hit us, and I knew from that point onwards, life for Samsara has changed forever. And I felt at that moment instinctively that life for me. And who, on some level, is gonna change? For me, life I can split into two halves. Now and it's clear there was life before samsara and life after samsara. When I was in Australia, I felt like the journey of samsara had already put me on a path where I was questioning life、um, quite deeply. But soon as COVID happened, I felt like it was urging me to isolate myself and question myself further. So when I came back, I I locked myself into a room for three days. And I wanted to meditate with no food, no water, and no leaving the room. So I stayed in this place because I wanted to be able to face myself, and to be able to go to the deepest crevice of my soul and ask questions. And I felt like that had a very profound effect on me. I felt it caused this sense of metamorphosis, like a caterpillar cocooning itself in a shell and transforming. And when this shell starts to break, the wings start to emerge, and the caterpillar transforms into a butterfly. But that process for me of facing myself was very important. I asked a lot of questions, of some which I got many answers, and some parts I still have to continue my journey, my own samsara. And if I was to reflect on samsara, I think it's important to be able to give yourself a self a sense of time, space. To really allow your soul to be nourished and to flourish in a way that can elevate you and those around.